I've just turned on the attendance, so please sign in. All right, be able to see this over here. All right, um, I understand that there's a book in stock yet, or still no? No, okay, if you don't get the readings by tomorrow, or don't get the books by tomorrow, uh, email me, and I can send you a PDF of the uh, reading for Thursday, because I don't want anyone to, um, I don't want to fall behind. All right. Um, I'm going to pass around. Does anyone need a tent card who wasn't here last week? Okay, I'll just. If you could just help me out here. I just got to figure out whoever needs it. Just take one. If you have one, just a big, big first name. I don't need your last name, just big first name. And that will make my life easier. Okay. All right. Uh, any. Questions or anything on your mind? No? Okay. All right. So um, let's start a class for today. Um, a few other things I just want to flag for you. Um, so we have the, uh, uh, the links to the various folders for this class. I want to just show you a few things. If you go to the class notes section B, you'll see here are the class for uh, here are the notes for today and for last week. I use something called Otter. Anyone, have, anyone know what Otter is? O T T E R. Okay. Otter is a transcription service. It's very good. Not perfect, but it's pretty accurate. My Zoom feed automatically gets put into Otter. What that means is that all of our classes are transcribed. What that means is you don't need to write down everything I say. In fact, you should, you should never do that, but definitely don't do it in my class. So, you know, here, here's class last week. Uh, what's that? Uh, still here. Uh, COVID is still here. We still have these plexiglass dividers. We still have these masks, but I think we'll have a good semester. Okay. Um, so what this means is after every class, if you check the class notes, I will put a link at the top of the page of the otter. And you can use that to fill in your notes and your gaps. Okay. But again, that means you don't need something to say, here, listen, absorb. Don't, don't. Trust me, it'll save you a lot. Um, Otter's not very expensive. If you ever want to use it for the purpose, it's like 20 bucks a month. And you get to basically upload any audio file and it transcribes it. It's a lifesaver. Also, I hate podcasts. I don't like listening to things. So if I ever want to listen to a podcast, I just transcribe and read it. Anyway, mileage may vary. So you have the class notes from uh, last class. Okay. Also, I mentioned um, I mentioned last week of the case summaries, which I post about the day before class. So you have Gen versus Rich, you have Keeble and Popov. You should read these before you come to class. They will be helpful. It will not help you answer every question I give to you, but I'll help you answer some of them, I think, at least. Maybe, maybe not. All right. Any questions so far? All right. Um, now, let's actually get to today's class. So this is our notes for today, class. Uh, where is it? That's over here. I'm sorry. Uh, class 2B. Um, I always like to begin class with poll questions. Um, you know how to do poll questions on the clicker device? Okay. The reason why we do these poll questions is not to test you. They're not graded. Right? I don't really care what you put. I mean, I care, but I'm not, I'm not grading you on it. Um, the reason why we do these sort of assessments at the start of every class is to give you immediate feedback, right? If you're getting these questions wrong, you should probably come talk to me. And I want you to know about this the first week of class and not when the midterm hits. Because once the midterm hits, it's getting to be almost too late. So we give you these assessments early on. If you're getting these questions right, it says, okay, you're doing something correct. If you're not really sure, mm, um, don't cheat on these. Uh, it's so stupid because they're not graded. Uh, don't ask your friends, what did you put for A, right? Just do these on your own and you'll be happier for it. Uh, the questions will be um, uh, a short answer. There'll be multiple choice. There'll be true, false. Um, various different types of questions I can ask you, okay? So let's just try one. And everyone, everyone can see the questions up here? This is weird. Artifact on the side. I'm not sure what that is. I'm not sure what this is either, but 
Actually, it's, you know what it is? It's a freaking plexiglass. Okay, I just figured it out. Okay, it took two seconds. Uh, right, the, these projections are built before we had these stupid dividers, but that's what we have. All right, let me do the poll question. Uh, poll question number, this will be short answer, number one. Okay. Uh, which screen? I think it's this one. No, it's this one. Desktop two. Okay. So question one, and this is oops, this is short answer. When one European nation finds a new territory for other European nations, there's acquisition by blank. Okay, another five seconds or so. All right, I'll stop it here. I try to give less than a minute per question because I don't want to take the entire class. Okay, who was last, last class? Who was? Oh, I was the next Oh, God, okay, can you write your name bigger when you get to the marker? I can't see that, just, and I only need first name, I don't need last name. I just see something, is that Cash? Yeah, Cash. Okay, I said the last name, it's Cash, okay. What'd you put here? Okay, what's acquisition by discovery? Uh huh. Uh, and, uh, the, the land. Okay, right. But the key point is, who is the discovery dragon relevant for? Good. Right. The discovery doctrine is a way of claiming land among the other European nations who are discovering. Good. The second question, and it gets on to the second part of our class from last week. This is a multiple choice, and that's going to be, uh, let's see, that's going to be, is that Camille? You're up in about a 45 seconds, so just get, get ready for it. Oh, this way. Sorry, Julius, you're up in about 40, 40 seconds. All right, another five seconds. All right, Julius, help us out here. What's your answer? Okay, so the question is, after a European nation finds a territory, it can acquire the land through conquest of the natives, purchasing from the natives, both the above, none of the above. So Julius, let me ask you a question. Under the rule in Johnson, can the native people sell Property. So are these are the native people even able to engage in buying and selling of land? So you want to maybe revise your answer? Well, you want to revise your answer? I guess I'm sorry. Yes, they can sell it, but they're very limited. I guess on that clause. All right. Let's let's see. Let's see what people put here. This is a curious one. Oh, it's pretty, pretty evenly. You know, about 40, 40 50 seconds. So look, here's the, here's the reason why my exams are not multiple choice, right? Because I hate multiple choice questions. I think you can make a good argument for A or C. I think I should argue either one. Let me explain to you why. Um, Johnson held that the, um, the native people lack the capacity to sell land, right? But... It might be that a country says, you know what? We don't want to engage in a war. We'll just go and buy it from them. So I think you either A or C. I think you go either way, right? But I want everyone to see why I framed the question this way. 
right? It's in some cases they were allowed to have peaceful negotiations and say, we'll just give you some trinkets, whatever, like Manhattan Island, right? Or if that doesn't go well, they'll say, okay, we'll just kill you. So I think go either way here, right? If you think of Manhattan Island as perhaps the good example, okay? Let's do question number three. This is also a short answer, just to use to fill in two different blanks. Okay. All right, let's do question three. And this will be for, uh, did I do that line yet? No? Okay, Maria, I think you're next. But just give another 30 seconds or so. Okay, another 10 seconds. All right, Maria, let's, let's stop the poll. What, what's your answers here? Under the rule in Johnson versus McIntosh, the native people have the right to blank the land, but cannot, that sounds wrong, but, but, but cannot blank the land. Exactly. What's the difference between occupying the land and selling the land? Uh -huh. Yeah, perfect. Exactly right. So the court recognized the right of occupancy, but just be very clear, this occupancy right was dependent upon the grace of the European nation, right? If the British decided you guys got to move on out, that right of occupancy was extinguished. So it was a temporary right. I think it was like a lease, if you will, that could be revoked at any point. A license even better than a lease. All right. Any questions? All right. Let's go on to today's material then. Very good with the uh, short answer questions. Um, last class, we talked about finding land, discovering land, conquering territory, right? Today's class is different. We're not finding land territory. We're finding animals, in particular, wild animals, right? And there's actually a big difference between domesticated animals and wild animals, right? Domesticated animals, think of like a cow, right? Lives in a person's farm, old McDonald, right? And the cow can't live on his own. He needs to be dependent upon the farmer to be milked and all these other things, right? A wild animal uh, is not dependent on any farmer. A whale, right? Uh, wild ducks, uh, we'll do a fox case next week. Uh, a baseball, right? These are all kind of wild animals that sort of just roam. And when you're a wild animal that roams from place to place, you're not fixed, right? Maybe in one day you're in this pond, the next day you're in that pond, or if you will, you swim throughout the ocean. The topic for today is how to acquire an wild animal. And students always have difficulty in these cases, not because they're hard, they're actually, I think, pretty straightforward. They have difficulty because there are many different rules. The whale case, for example, cites three cases, each with slightly different rules. I know all of them, unfortunately, I'm sorry. The duck case seems to have two different rationales. I know both of them. And then the baseball case is all over the place. It's just kind of, <laughs> they have no idea what they're doing at that point, right? It's like, well, they really don't know, just split the baseball in half. All right, so let's start with uh, our first case, uh, Gen versus Rich. Is that Matilda? Yeah. Matilda, can you give us the facts in Gen, please? Can you please give us the facts in Gen v. Rich, the first case? Uh, it's not an excuse. Like, oh, did you do the reading? Yeah. All right, well, you want to try just give me what the facts are? The first case. Yeah, with the whale. No, just the facts. What happened? What were the facts? All right, so, okay, so who, who killed the whale? Just I want, I want, if you're giving me the rule, let's show the simple facts. Who, who killed the whale? Yeah, I 
All right, well, how about this? For next class, can you try to be ready for these social questions? Okay, so did he, did you in the same boat? No, kind of ended. Okay, so Gen killed the whale. How did he kill the whale? Okay, harpoon. Okay, so Gen went to sea. He shot this whale with a harpoon, basically a spear, right? What happens after you shoot a whale with a spear? What happens to the whale? Okay. All right, let me ask you a dumb question. Is it, is it Diddy? Do you see him? Did it. Let me ask you, it seems like a very simple question. Why couldn't Gen just shoot the whale and drag it back to the to the, to the, to the shore? Yeah, 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 exactly right. The, thank you very much, very good. The whale is big, right? I think I have some pictures of it in the, um, uh, in the um, uh, lecture notes. The whale is about 90 feet long. So if you want to see, this is a, what a person about six feet tall is. The whale's huge, right? It weighs up to 70 tons. Just for comparison, an elephant weighs about eight tons. So this is like 10 times the size of an elephant. It is physically impossible, impossible for a small boat. I mean, we're talking a small wooden boat here. We're not talking about a huge boat. For a small wooden boat, think of like Moby Dick, right? For a small wooden boat to drag to shore this ginormous whale. It's not possible. So instead, the whalers of this New England community shot the whale with a thing called a bomb lance. Just imagine putting a rocket on a spear. It's an RPG, right? But without the grenade part. It's just a rocket on a spear and it sails into the whale. All right, and oh, I don't see a name tag. What's, what's your name? Elizabeth? Esther. Esther. Can someone just get her name, name correctly? Get it this way. Okay, Esther, let me ask you a question. What was unique about each of these spears? Why were these spears very sort of specialized to each Okay. Well, let me ask this question. When, when they shot the whale and it sank to the bottom of the ocean, how were they supposed to figure out who shot it? Symbol on it. Exactly, very good. Each crew, right? Each whaling crew had a different mark on their spear. Right? Think of a cattle brand, right? You all know what a cattle brand is? Right? If you ever go to a farm, at least maybe in the olden days, but maybe still, each farm had a specific mark, a brand they would put on the cow or on the horse, right? The reason why is so if the horse ran away, if the cow ran away, you know, oh, that's John's farm. That's from the, the King Ranch, right? That's from the Grand Ranch, whatever ranch it happens to be. This was a sort of custom that developed to make sure that every kill could be returned to sender, so to speak, right? Because imagine you put all this work into hunting a, cat, a whale. It sinks to the bottom of the ocean. And you don't know who killed it. Now, these brands, these marks were not perfect. Right? Because you can imagine you throw a harpoon at the whale, and maybe it kind of grazes the whale skin, and it doesn't leave a clean mark. Right? And then the um the spear floats away. Right? If the spear is still inside the whale, it's like, okay, that's 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 again spear, right? But if it's just like, you know, imagine the, the harpoon zip, goes right through, it doesn't really leave a mark of any of any uh, clarity. And who knows where it is. Okay, so again. Went out to sea with his crew. He shot this whale. The whale sank to the bottom of the ocean. Right, James? Oh, James, I want you to kind of ask a, 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 a kind of a jerk question. I don't know if Gen actually killed this whale. Do we even know? I mean, I, I know that's not going to be the case, but do we actually know if Gen killed this whale? Uh, no, we just know that he's playing. Uh, he's playing. So everyone feels really bad for the guy. Maybe he was lying. You know, do you want to think about that? How do we know? Now, 
James, let me ask you another less jerk question. Why, why did no one just doubt him? Why would people think, okay, this is probably it? Why, why was there like a dispute over whether it was actually his claim? Why do you think? I mean, if he was in that dwelling area, it would have been a smaller, kind of a good uh, industry. So, and plus, this was common practice among the dwellers. Uh, so, I guess it's somewhat with it being a close community, this being a common practice, people normally took, you know, dwellers or Excellent. Okay, very good. Look, this is a whaling community, right? These are a group of fishermen who sort of work together in the same industry. There's a certain trust among hunters, right? Any hunters in the room? You tend to trust, right? So if Gen goes ahead and just makes up this crazy story, the hunting of whale, it wasn't true, people will find out and it'll come back to buy them later. So we'll just assume the facts are stated. Gen was the hunter who, who tracked down this whale. And put the harpoon into it. Okay. So then, is it Monica? Monica, help us out. What happened after the whale sank to bomb the ocean? Alice, that found the whale. Where, where, where did we find the whale? Yeah, right. So basically, the whales wash ashore. They, you ever see a, that a, what, a beach whale? Right. It's kind of disgusting. It's really gross. They they wash ashore, and they're just these ginormous beasts. Now, just another dumb question. Why were they killing whales? Like, what, was this for fun? What was the purpose of, the, of this enterprise? To extract oil from the Right. So today we get oil from the ground, right? They didn't know about that back then. The way they got oil, and this is kind of gross, was by killing a whale and basically sucking it and, and, and well, trying it, but taking the oil out of their skin. And they use that for uh, lamp oil, uh, for heating. I think like. A whale made 20 gallons of oil. Just it's insane how many whales can kill to make a small amount of oil. Okay. So Monica, the whale washes the bottom of the sea, it comes ashore, Ellis finds what happened there. Okay. Now did did Ellis ever say, hey, did anyone find a whale? No. Okay, my next question is up is there one more question for you. The auction house or the auctioners. They guys have known he's not a whaler, right? Did they still kind of look the other way? Yeah. So, Zara, let me ask you a question, please. Rich would have to buy this whale auction. Do you think Rich would have bought it to be a purchaser to use the phrase? Do you think he would like, he maybe knew something was up with this transaction? Because, I mean, this guy else is not a whaler, but he's selling this trade on his whale. What, you know, due diligence maybe Rich should have. Done before he went ahead and bought this whale. Oh, check the markings well. But maybe the best point the whale is all rotted. You know, who knows? What else could have you done? Bingo. You could have asked around and said, hey, whalers, uh, I found this whale in this region. It's up for auction. Did anyone, you know, hunt a whale in this region? I think it's about 17 miles away from the hunt. So it's, you know, pretty close. Did you do that, Zara? Is it Zara or Zara? There. Did you do that? No. You didn't do a damn thing. Right? Why do you think, one last question there, why do you think Rich didn't ask any questions and didn't kind of drop the boat? Oh, sorry, sorry. He wanted to probably save himself the trouble. What do you think he wanted? He wanted money. Right? He said, look, it's a cheap, it's, 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 it's what you might call speculation, right? He bought it because there's a possibility that it might be valuable for him. I think that's it, as simple as that. Okay, so Ellis goes ahead, sells it off to Rich. Rich puts it up for auction, uh, Rich buys it at the auction. And then who finds out? But again, he's like, what the, what's, what's, it's mine, right? I killed it. Now again, they can't really prove Gen killed this particular whale, right? Maybe he killed a whale. We don't know if it was this whale. We, we just know it did because again, the harpoon with the little symbol was not inside the, um, a whale's carcass. Again, these are huge. It's all rotted. It's hard to even know what that's going on in there. This is a very weird profession. All right, so it goes to court. All right, so again, sues Rich. Um, uh, is that Brock? Brock, a lot of this case is about what we might call custom. 
or usage rates. What are customer usages? Now, how do you define common practice here? Now, I'm going to ask you this because it's like a dumb question, but obviously Ellis and Rich didn't set those practices. They did their own thing. They put up the auction on their own. How are the courts to know what the actual practices are? You're going to bring the precedent. Again, says one thing, Rich says the other thing. How is the court to know? Okay, good, good. Now we're looking at class cases, right? So the court says, look, there's no statute that governs it, right? The legislature didn't really write a rule about this, or Congress hasn't written a rule. So we'll look to some of the past cases, right? And there are three, right? There are three such past cases, right? There are three such past cases. Uh, uh, Tyler, tell me about the first case they mentioned. It's called, uh, was it um, Tabor? Yeah, thank you, just to find out. It's Tabor. Tabor. Tabor versus Jenny, which is from the 1850s. Okay, but say it again. So when the when the anchor is stuck to the whale, right? It belongs to who? Okay. In our case here, is the anchor still attached to the whale? Was there an anchor in the whale? One more time. So in our case, was there an anchor attached to the whale? Okay. So does the rule in favor? Resolve damage birth rate. All right, Kyle. So Kyle, there's a there's a second case that's mentioned. It was a Bartlett against Bud. What happened there? Okay, so help us out here. What does firm possession mean, Kyle? Well, again, can I hold the whale in my hands? Uh, no. Can I put the whale onto my boat? No, when you when you tie it up, when there's something attached to it, right? But again, what happens if the anchor or the flag, whatever, falls out? All right. So I want you to just focus on the Bartlett case for a minute, right? Kyle gave me the right word. He said firm possession. Um, but firm possession is kind of hard with a huge, ginormous, slippery whale, right? It's you, you can't like, it's not like a fox or a duck you can put your hands around. This is a huge animal. So what the courts say is when you have such a big animal, acquiring it, the rules for acquiring it are slightly different, right? You have to treat each animal differently. The rules for foxes and ducks are we different than the rules for whales? It has to be because it's such a huge animal. Right? So in Bartlett, the court says, um, property has been acquired by the first taker by actual possession. Right? And it's sufficient. You don't have to actually put the whale in your arms. But you have to put some sort of iron or some sort of attachment to it. But again, in our case, we do not have that. The whale has no anchors, has no flags, nothing. Okay, and then this, uh, is that uh, John? The third case, this is a uh, Swift against Gifford. What happened there? Yeah, and again, does that help us here? No. So none of these cases are actually helpful, are they? Isn't that funny? They have like all these precedents, none of which govern this dispute. So it, maybe it's the case that Usually the iron does hold, right? Usually there is something, some marker, some nail. This is a hard case though. And that's why it's in your book, right? It's a hard case because there's no statute. None of the precedents govern it. It's sort of, uh, we don't really know. So John, help us out here. What does the court do then? What does, I mean, the judge has got to do something. He's got to rule for A or B. Can't, can't say, <laughs> throw my hands up. I don't know, you guys figure it out yourselves. What does he do here? <laughs>
Oh, he followed the custom of which were true. That's exactly right. The judge finds that the custom of the whalers is reasonable. Right? Again, he has no statute. He has no precedent governing his case, seeing a pattern right for a semester. The sort of just working on first principles. And the first principle they adopt is that the taker did all that he could do to claim occupancy, right? He took all the reasonable steps under the custom in effect. He shot the whale. And no iron held to it, but that wasn't that wasn't required. So what was the custom? The custom was when a whale washes ashore, whoever finds it sends word saying, hey, I found a whale. He might get a finder's fee, what's called a salvage. And that's how it works. And the fact that Rich and Ellis didn't follow this custom means they lose. Now, let me just take a step back. Is that Ryan? Yeah. Ryan, the courts, usually when a person acts in bad faith, what do courts do? How do courts usually keep bad faith active? Just give them a law school first semester. What courts do you think? Yeah, the courts like to reward people who act in bad faith. Yeah. Do you think rich are acting in bad faith? Yeah. Yeah, they do. Uh, they would have the market to thank you so much. I think there's one other one to send it forward to. Right. Courts don't like to reward bad faith actors. Why? Because rich took advantage of the system. He knew something was up, and he didn't care. He bought the whale anyway. I think this court also saying, look, this custom that the whalers have rewards hard work. I am not going to reward the person who tries to cheat, the person who took a shortcut. Right? We're going to reward the hard work, not the cheater. All right. So again, the holding, oh, there it is right there. Thank you. The holding, these markers just tend to disappear. The holding of this case, right? is that the court defers the usage, the custom of the community. Right, they defer to the custom of the community, of the whaler community. And what, that, what does that custom say? As long as you take the necessary steps to sort of bring it into your occupancy, even if you're not successful putting the harpoon in, you still have a claim to the whale. And because the whale's already basically Chopped up into a million pieces, they awarded damages to the um, uh, to the hunter to, to get. Questions on the first case. Questions on the first case. <coughs> None? Maybe it's early. You have... Yeah, oh, please. Thank God, Leah. Okay. When I don't get questions, I get nervous. Oh, my God. What did I do wrong? Like, I... Yeah, Leah, go ahead. Um, maybe I missed that someone committed suicide. Can I read out how to kill the animal? Or... Ah, what a good question. Okay, so this is going to sound like a dumb response, but I promise it's important. What does it mean to kill an animal? So you're talking about a, a huge whale. Can a person actually kill a whale? Okay. When the harpoon strikes the whale, do you think the whale dies instantly? Yeah. What happens to the whale? Yeah. It bleeds out, right? Eventually, we'll sink to the bottom of the ocean after a couple days, as the case goes. So it's not even clear if the hunter actually killed the whale. That's never the test. For all we know, the whale died of old age. All right, for all we know, this whale just died of old age, you know, in the same vicinity. So the test is never, did you kill it? Now, with a fox, you can say. So then again, what if it does say you shoot a fox in the leg and it sort of hobbles along, right? And then someone else came and took it. Who actually killed the fox? So there's actually a lot of debate over who killed it versus who killed the mortal wound. We'll do that a little bit later. A good question. All right. Other questions? No more questions? Okay. All right. Let's go on to the next case. 
All right, let's try. I already did question four. I asked Kyle or Tyler or someone. Uh, or maybe it was Brock. It was Brock. Uh, all right, let's do question five then. Short answer. Question five. Who owned the ducks on Keeble's Pond? I know it's going to sound like a stupid question, but I promise there's a point. And this will be for uh, as the M A Margo. I will get your name soon enough. I promise. It takes a few. Takes runs to the class. All right, another ten seconds. All right, I'm going to stop in five, four, three, two, one. Okay, Margo. I know it sounds like a dumb question, but to follow up on it. Who owns the ducks on, on Keeble's Pond? Keeble. Okay, now the harder question. Why? A little bit louder. I'm having trouble hearing you. Ah. What is the Latin doctrine that you just described? You gave me the correct rule. What's the Latin phrase for it? Excellent. Very good, Margo. Thank you. Unfortunately, there's more Latin in this class. I know you hate Latin, but you got to know it. Uh, Rationing utility, right? This is a important doctrine that pops up throughout this class, right? If I own the land, I generally own whatever is on top of it and whatever is below it. So I might own good oil or gas or gold or jewels on my, my soil. I own that. If there's a structure in the land, I own that. If there are wild animals, like Marco said, a duck that's on my pond, I own that. Do you even know the air rights? Have you used air rights in courts? That sounds familiar, right? There's an airplane or some nuisance flying overhead, you have your air rights as well. You own, you own everything all the way up to the heavens and down to, the, down to hell, right? That's what I used to say, right? All the way up to down. That extends to wild animals. So if a duck lands on your pond, or more accurately, if you attract a duck, if you bring a duck onto your pond by building various devices, the duck is yours so long as it's on your, your farm, your, your pond. But ducks don't stay stationary, right? Ducks fly away. Okay. Andrew, you guys, you from the, what country are you from again? Okay, I have a video from the Netherlands, so not quite, but in, in the ballpark, okay? Um, so I want to show you how these duck decoys work, okay? Here, uh, no, wrong, wrong video. That's for the baseball case. Okay, so this is how the duck decoys work, right? These duck decoys are basically these traps that the ducks fly into, and then they can be whatever it is you do with ducks. It's in, it's in, I think it's in Dutch, so I don't understand it either, but you can just watch the pictures. Do you speak Dutch? Okay, didn't think so. Okay. Oh, well. okay. The verschrikte vogels vliegen dan aan het eind van de pijp en vangen net binnen. De koeken komt dan snel aangelopen en sluit het vanghokje af. En zie die pols de ding. Oké, dan is dat ja. Oké, dat is het. Yeah, there's, there's your dash for the day. Okay. Um, so Keeble has a pond, and he builds these elaborate, they're called decoys, which I don't know why they're called that, but they're called decoys. And uh, you want to reuse one of these things? Okay. They build these elaborate decoys. They trap the ducks. Okay. So Helene, right? So Keeble has his pond. He builds these elaborate duck decoys. But he has a name with the computer, right? Uh, Tinker and Wheel is his name. What does the neighbor do here? Is he actually shooting the ducks? Yeah. No, but what is what is he doing? He's scaring the ducks away, right? Now, why do you think the neighbor 
is doing this, right? He's, the ducks, he's like catching them. He's just shooting it in the air, you know, firing his gun in the air. Why is he doing this? Uh, or, more likely, do you think his neighbors like each other? Yeah. Why is he shooting his gun up in the air to scare the ducks? To be a jerk. He's a jerk. But maybe he's trying to bring the ducks over, but more likely, he fired the gun. Ducks are fly away. They went hunting, right? He fired the gun. The ducks, they scatter. All, all people are down here. I've never been hunting in my life. I don't know. I'm just speaking from anecdote, right? He's scaring the ducks to be a jerk, right? His neighbor built this elaborate duck decoy, and then he's building this, you know, this huge thing, and he's boom, just blowing the ducks up. Scare them away. Okay, so okay, get everyone there. There's two more guys. Look at that. Hey, Mark, I once had a semester where there were four students, a guy and a guy and a girl and a girl. They just had the same name sent next to each other. It drove me crazy. They didn't do it deliberately. Uh, so Mark over here. Okay. Um, evil Sue's Pickering Day. What is his ground for the lawsuit? What, what does he actually allege in his lawsuit? But, but did he actually take the duck? Is this like the whale case where he stole the, where he stole the whale? So they can't actually sue for a return of the duck, can they? You can't actually sue for the value of the duck, you know that's the duck. What did he actually sue for in this case? He did not bring a nuisance claim. What did he actually bring a claim for? What was actually his claim? It's not a nuisance. What was actually his claim? Sarah, let's sort of jump to the end, right? What, what damage is this for the world? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, say it again. Lost profit. Wait a minute, hold on. Did people build this elaborate duck hunting thing as a way to hunt ducks to make a profit? Why do you think he has a lab that can handle this? Why do you think he built this elaborate duck before? For fun, it was a hobby. So then, what on earth was it coming to? Yeah, I mean, just I want you guys just to pause for a minute. Why are these two people in court, right? These two wealthy British dudes with big wigs and stuff, right? This is this is what they look like, right? They're, they're very big wigs. Trust me. Like the big wigs. Uh, that's Hickory Gill, right? With the huge wig, right? Actually, I, I can probably pull that hair off. I think, you know, I can actually, if I try. Uh, <laughs> the picture on the wall is still missing me. I'm going to update that picture. Right? So, why are these people in court? These are wealthy dudes who had a dispute over their hunting hobby. I think the closest claim, right? The actual cause of action would be unfair competition, right? I'm engaging in a trade. Or, or an occupation, which the court says, and you came along and you were a jerk and you sort of interfered with my profession. That's the closest I can think of. It's not really, it's not a nuisance. I think uh, was it Margo said nuisance. I mean, that's that's in the ballpark. That's not what they claimed here. And because no one ever actually captured the fox in the fox, the ducks, there's no claim for damages for the ducks. There's no replevin because they can't return the duck they don't have. All right, so it's a very weird case. All right, so uh, Christina, are you there? Uh, okay, Christina. Sorry, that was just a Zoom thing. You're seeing you there. I just did a Zoom thing. Are you there? Are you <laughs> wow, I got to break that. Are you there? <laughs> oh, yeah. it's, it's amazing how stuff gets internalized, right? Like, no one's going to mute it. It's awesome. There's been no muting. We all here live. Oh, there are a couple people watching on Zoom. Hi. Um, <laughs> yeah, that got people. Hello. Uh, in, in PCR land, we'll say. Um, uh, I actually got tested on Saturday night. My, my daughter had a slight congestion, I thought, from three cats. Well, all negative, but all good. Um, 
By the way, Memorial Village, if you need, I got my results in two hours. Two hours. I can sing. We got there Saturday at like 11 by 1.30 with the results. I don't know. PCR, I don't know if that's even possible. But Memorial Village, right? Memorial near I-10. Very nice. Okay. Um, we talked about rationing solely, right? That was his option asked that a few minutes ago. Isn't this an easy case for the rationing solely? Right? The ducks run as planned, therefore they get stopped. Isn't that an easy argument? Why did the court not just say rationing solely the ducks are belonging to Mr. Akimo? You're right, you're right. But why did the court not rely on ration solely? That seems like such a easier basis to rule. Yeah, we don't have a good answer. And I'm asking, I guess, an unfair question. Um, so I do. Um, do you even notice afterwards? It seems this case was argued a couple times, and the judge, this is Chief Justice Holt. Uh, I think I have his picture here. This is another guy with a big wig, right? You ever the expression he's a big wig? That's right. It's a big wig. He's a big wig, right? He's a big guy, right? He apparently considered the rational solely doctrine like he's gonna mention it then. He thought it was good, but then he came around to this other ruling, which gives you a much broader rule, right? A holding based on rational solely is pretty narrow, right? The ducks were on Keeble's pond, therefore the ducks belong to Mr. Keeble. But instead, the court went down this other route, right? So that Austin? Austin, help me out here. What route did the court go down? What was the basis of the court's ruling? Um, what was the basis of the court's ruling? Very simple question. Uh, basically, that. Uh, since there was, um, since there was under, they're doing it to trade and they're allowed to, and since the scope of trade, they're not allowed to hinder somebody that's kind of, or that, that's anticipating. Why, why can you guys compete with someone else's trade? Uh, because that would, uh, I guess because the way he went about it was not legal, it wasn't lawful to be like him. He did it in a way that was a trespasser. So but did he actually trespass the other guy's land? Well, no, but the way he did, that could be a nuisance through. But there's no, but there's no nuisance. My question is different. Why, why did the court say this unfair competition is illegal? Where did the court get from? I guess it goes, I've heard and so there's not, and also there's not somebody trying to take advantage. Right, you, you, you're doing all this stuff, right? Is it a money? Why is unfair competition so bad? Why is it for a couple of months? Okay, now we're getting closer, right? Why is the court adopting this rule to promote fair competition? Let me ask much a little bit. What is the court trying to reward? Okay, let me ask the question. Very good. Okay, uh, is it Brian? Brian, let me ask a follow up question to you. What would happen if the court ruled the opposite? If the court said, now people lose this, they turn most fine, you'd love to be a jerk. Oh, would anyone take the time to build these elaborate duck traps if some jerk neighbor could come along and just shoot that in the air? Uh, think about the, uh, the whale case one more time. If the court had ruled in favor of the of Rick and against the whale, what would that have done to the whaling industry? Why? Because then you would have to basically have people on the boat and employ salvages and hope that 
first. Good, excellent, very good, thank you. Both the first case and the second case have a common thread, right? There's a common theme in the first case and the second case. What is that common theme? Rewarding productive labor. Right, both the first case and the second case, they're rewarding productive labor. They want to create a rule that ensures those who put hard work into an issue, into a, into a, into a hunt, are rewarded. Because the opposite holding would penalize those industries. It would penalize the whalers. And the whalers would say, you know what? This isn't worth my time. I'm not going to risk my life to hunt this 70 ton whale if some jerk can come along and steal it. In the duck case, people built this elaborate duck trap. The court says, we're going to reward the guy who built the duck trap, right? We're not going to create a rule that would punish this, this elaborate process. OK? Uh, is, that, is, that, is that Rodney? Yes, sir. So let me ask you a question. You said in the first case that the court didn't like bad faith actions, right? It didn't like the uh, uh, bridge that you tried to be honest. Do you think it's a similar? Dynamic at play in this, in this case, in the duck case. Who's the jerk here? Who's the bad faith actor? The Hickory Hill, right? Why is Hickory Hill being a bad faith actor? Well, as we discussed, he's just kind of doing it to be a jerk, really. Yeah. All right, so you're sensing a pattern, right, in the property class. I think all the law school. Generally, the person who's the jerk loses. Right? That's not like a like a black letter rule, but it's pretty damn close, right? Um, Courts do not like parties who engage in bad acts, right? Often you have a dispute, both parties are at arm's length, right? But there's a dispute of how to read a contract, right? Or there's some issue with, with something happened and they both have sort of good arguments about why each should win. Those are hard cases. This is not a hard case. You have a guy who's a good person hunting, well, you don't hunting but you know, he, he put a lot of work into his uh, duck trap. There's other guys being in church. Come along, firing his gun up in the air, making a ruckus. Okay. All right, so the holding here, right? The holding in uh, Keeble is that we should give encouragement to the owners of these duck decoys, right? They should reap the benefits of their work. And, uh, has a right to engage in this and to use his duck decoy for his use. Right. The court does not rely on rational holdings. I think it's an easier basis, but they make a much bigger ruling on unfair trade. Right. The, the court gives an analogy. They say, well, you know, if there's a school and you open up a school across the street, you can compete with each other. That's fine. You can't start shooting against the other school. Kind of a funny example makes no sense, but you know, the, the court kind of uses a rhetorical device. Okay. Questions on case number two on Keeble. Yeah, I just don't see a name tag. I'm sorry. That's okay. What's your name? Zach. Zach, go ahead. Um, so like for prospect like court, for example, like custom like evidence, like the health you establish, like if there's negligence in the court, like Custom will actually like determine. Yeah, like, it, it's even more, it. isn't it? Right. So it's a good point. Like in torts, whatever, to decide the duty of care might be, you might look at what the custom is. But here, the rule itself is based in the custom industry. Isn't that funny? It's a little different. Yeah, very good point. Yeah, property, I'm telling you, is different than other classes. The way rules develop here are distinct from when they develop in other areas. Yes, uh, Stephanie, go ahead. So, I know um, you talked about that there wasn't any interest claim or a trespass claim, but okay. in all two of those reports, so could he have brought in a trespass claim for doing things? Do we know where he actually shot the gun? Do we know if he shot it over the boundary? We're not sure. Um, 
So I don't know if he shot. I mean, if, if you shoot a gun up in the air and you're and again, I don't know if there was actually a projectile. I don't know if there's a bullet in the gun. I just shot powder. Right. Now, was it a nuisance? Maybe. Right. Uh, maybe it was such a loud, smelly, noisy thing that it created a nuisance. You know, these are pretty big estates, right? And a, a, a gunshot is like, you know, it lasts like, you know, just a split second. Is that enough for a nuisance? Do you think of a nuisance like an ongoing thing? Just even a one second, is that enough for a nuisance? Maybe the damage will be small. So maybe he chose to bring this, this sort of trade claim. Okay, other questions? That's funny. Yeah, Ali, go ahead. Yeah, what if he was hunting himself on his property, right? Imagine you shoot a gun, maybe he was shooting ammo on top. Of I think the fact he was firing the air for the sole purpose of trying to screw over his neighbor doesn't make a difference. I mean, I think that at least in the court file. Yeah. Other questions? All right, again, so if you're looking at case number one and case number two, the theme is rewarding labor, right? Um, Labor, labor. Where we mentioned labor before, Ben. Where we mentioned labor before, we talked about. Where we mentioned labor before. Not uh, well, the theory we talked about. Wait, remember the theory. What's labor theory? It's so nice to walk around the class and go like that. Okay. Miranda, what's this labor theory? That someone is going to do more work and labor into the property of the land, and they would have a claim over someone that has to put any improvement to the land. Exactly. Okay. This is labor theory by John Hall. L O C D B. John Hall. And labor theory rewards a person who invests, that's an empty just, labor, effort, energy, right? Even if they don't get the item in the end, they may still have a strong claim to it. So the whalers put all this effort into hunting the whale, but they didn't have the whale to show for it. This other guy just found it on the beach. So labor theory would say we reward the hunter with all this energy into hunting the whale. Think of the, um, the Keeble case. He built these elaborate traps. He lured the ducks into his property, and at the last minute, this jerk next door blows up a gun and scares the ducks away. Here again, we reward the person with the labor into getting the animal. All right, so labor theory, I think, plays an important role in both cases today, both the duck case and the whale case. All right. Okay, so now I'll come back to you, Ben. Ben, what's the rule of capture? What's the rule of capture? Look at the labor theory. What's the rule of capture? Bring one. Okay, so say an animal, right? How do you capture an animal? Good. Good, good, good. Good answer, right? So the rule of capture is kind of another theory we're talking about, right? So there's a rule of labor, the labor theory, the rule of capture, right? Rule of capture concerns actual possession but actual possession doesn't always mean you have it in your hands think of the whale right you cannot put a whale in your hands we well, you put a duck in your hands you put a box in your hands. box a little bigger because a box in your hands right so we talked about the benefit of the rule of labor i'll ask actually i'll ask question seven for uh who's that uh, Rick. Rick. 
Is the rule of Castor fair? Uh, I would say generally it's fair. In what regard? It allows for a person to go to another object or piece of property that's abandoned. Right, but let's talk about the whale case, right? The Dan put all this effort on the well, risked his life, and then Rich just found out, or else found on the beach. He had possession. How is it fair to reward the guy who found on the beach? In that case, it wouldn't be fair. So you're revising your answer to question number seven? Unless you determine the capture is something different from the, uh, the second person to come along and acquire the health property. The capture started whenever the hunter. That's right. That's right. Let me ask everyone. Let me do the poll question. Question seven. I'll, I'll, I'll give it to everyone. People might disagree. The answer is actually better than you think. And I'll explain why in a minute. Think very carefully on question number seven. What does fair mean? One of my least favorite words in the English language. I hate it. Okay, another 10 seconds, and I'll ask Tiffany this question in, in, in 10 seconds. You know what I found? Teaching on Zoom took more time. I'm able to move the material quicker now than on Zoom, because I'm having to adjust my timing, if you've noticed. My timing is a little bit off. I have to, you will never even notice unless I tell you, but Zoom just takes more time to explain. Just it's, it's... All right, Tiffany, let's, let's hear from you. Let me ask you a question that you're going to hate. Um, what does fair mean? We're asked the question to say, what does fair? Oh my god, that's the best law school, the best law student answer I've ever heard. It depends on the context. That's like <laughs> law student's goal. All right, try it again. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But it's such a good, it's just like, it's perfectly free. You have 30 seconds to think about it also. You, you just like, get ready for it. What does fair mean? Depends on the context. Let's do this. Good. Good, thanks. Okay, so give me the pros and cons. I'll give you true or false. Right? I want you to give me the answer for both. Give me the argument that the real capture is fair. Give me the truth. Okay. Well, I'm asking the rule of capture. The rule of capture is the opposite of labor. Again, think of the whale is here, right? The whale is with all this effort on the whale, but some jerk found on the beach. The rule of capture would say, okay, there's no harpoon in it, it goes to the guy on the beach. So tell me why that's fair. Tell me why that's fair. Give me the true argument. This one's hard. And they start thinking that as well. Ooh, that's creative. What do you mean overmind? That's creative. Oh, that's really good. I want to check this very guys. I haven't actually been thinking about that before. It's good. Uh, she said it, it might compensate for. What do you call that? Sorry, that's the wrong question. What do you call all people hunting all at the same time and doing those research? What's that called? Yeah. Exactly. The tragedy of commons. Yeah. And you're going to hear it. You have to correct me. Very good. Tragedy of commons, right? So maybe the role of capture might mitigate, might, 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 might reduce the tragedy of commons, right? Because if you only know you get to keep what you actually get to put in your hand, then you're going to kill less. Okay? So now, Nick, let me ask the other one. Why might the role of capture be fair for another reason? Give another reason for sure. uh, For another reason, I would say that it's fair is the fact that it kind of, I guess, by happenstance, maybe that the person who knows where he came from could even find that person so that resource could just go to waste 
Uh -huh. So remember at the beginning of class, I asked you a question. How do you know Ken actually killed this whale? Do you know? Maybe this whale died of old age. Right, maybe, maybe again, in fact, our Puna whale didn't watch that to see how it's going to kill it. If we have a dispute in court where Gen says that's my whale and the judge says prove it, what proof do we have here? Does Gen have any proof this is his whale? The courts like he said, he said, she said, he said, he said. But the courts like a he said, he said here? Why? But who actually has real evidence of the whale? There's no mark here. But so who's the only party who has evidence that actually have a possession? Bingo. Right, so think of it this way, right? Very good. The benefit of the rule of capture is it's a very bright line rule. You like bright line rules? Washington's love bright line rules, right? It's bright line rule. He came to shore, he found it, it's his. Courts sometimes like bright line rules because it's easy to apply. Because there's no conflicting testimony. Courts hate conflicting testimony because it's who I believe, this guy or this guy. I don't know. Right? Maybe this guy's a jerk, but sometimes jerks are right. But as long as jerks are better on the wall, it happens. So if you think of this question, I, I like Tiffany's answer, it's very good. But the the the, the other answer you can think of is it's an easy rule to apply in court. An easy rule to fair. But we all know what the standard is. But generally people say rule capture is not fair. Why? Because it does not reward the person who worked the hardest. It does not reward the person who puts all this effort into this elaborate whale hunt and risks his life and limb to bring back this, you know, barrel of oil. All right, so let's see what people put here. I'm gonna put I'm gonna say false. Let's see. Yeah, about 70% false. This is probably what I think is about the uh, the general consensus, but but I don't think A is wrong either. I think I think there are certain benefits. I didn't put that in from B here. Labor theory, by contrast, is fair, right? Uh, oh, back now, Nicholas. Oh, you don't. You call that one reason? Look at this, a class and a half. Perfect. They think I said you get called in every class and a half or so. I'm right on, right on target. Nicholas, back down here. Tell me, why is labor theory fair? That's great. With the labor theory, you're rewarding the person who puts all the effort and energy and, and initiative into the hunt, right? But Nicholas, finish up. What's the downside of labor theory? It doesn't invest a lot of your time in the hunt, and it might not be able to get to other projects. What happens in court if someone says, I get it by labor theory? Why are they arguing that? Ah. So yeah, well, let me ask you a follow-up question. Is that Bill Clinton in socks? Yeah. What an obscure shirt. I, I okay. <laughs> <laughs> what, you're reborn here. Uh, ninety-eight. Okay, you're close up. All right. Um, yeah, <laughs> socks like me so alive in ninety-eight. Okay, so with the labor theory, if you're in court arguing labor theory, what do you not have? You don't have possession. If you have possession, you're arguing it, right? If you actually have possession, you're going to argue here. I have the fox. I have the duck, but. If you're in court arguing labor theory, that means you didn't catch it, right? And then what's the court going to do with that? Yes, now we're on the right track. How do you prove how much effort you put into a hunt? Witnesses, your hunting buddies, yeah. right? You know, Maybe that. you're not good at hunting. No, Right, no, this is what you're not. What's the last thing you said? Maybe you're not good at hunting, so I'll just get rewarded. Right, it. what if you're a lousy hunter? You said all day hunting, but you're doing it poorly. There are a lot of very difficult factual questions involved with labor theory. We'll see a lot of this in the class when Thursday Piercing is closed. Okay, yeah, any other questions? So, just we're starting to, yeah, yeah, Amar, go ahead. Oh, he did. He was the one who chopped it up. What, what if he chopped up the whale? He put labor in also. He chopped it up. Well, isn't that a hard question, right? What's harder? Well, what's more labor, hunting it or chopping it up? No, it's just chopping it up. 
I actually have no idea. I have no idea the answer. But, but in my mind, chopping up the whale is not a life or death proposition. You're not going to die by chopping it. You might die by hunting it. But I think it's a good question. Yeah, labor theory is not bright, you know, clear. People with different amounts of work into it. You can chop enough for it. I, I don't know. I have no idea. I've never chopped a whale before. Isn't it a sort of Seinfeld where the whale washes ashore and then George like a free biologist? Oh, quit it like Seinfeld. I don't know. <laughs> Good. All right, any other questions on the second case? All right, let's do the last case, uh, baseball case. Um, uh, does anyone actually remember the Barry Bonds home run issue? Okay, maybe a couple of you do. This was a huge deal. Um, this was during the steroids era of baseball, uh, where these players used to be very small, like this, right? And in the span of a couple years, players like Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa and Barry Bonds just demolished all these home run records that had been standing for decades. Uh, they were all juiced. They were all on massive steroids. They just had like these ginormous muscles. And then they were just hitting the balls out of the park every day. Um, so in, what was it, 2002? I think it was 2002, right, with Barry Bonds. Um, yeah, uh, 2001, I'm sorry, I lost my year. In 2001, Barry Bonds was about to set the record for having the most home runs in a season. And so this is the clip. And this is actually from a movie trailer. I'll just play a clip. It's about a minute long. There's the payoff. Floating the Bonds. And he hits it high. Oh, it's coming right at me. He hits it deep. Oh, my God. It's like heading right for me. And it is. Patrick Hayashi of Santa Clara County comes up with his jewel out in the right field bleachers. Patrick is going to be the Bay Area's newest millionaire. I was screaming at the top of my lungs. He's not the guy who caught the ball. I go up. I'm, I'm probably six inches taller than anybody around me. I catch it. Then we start to realize that this is actually a bigger story than just this historic home run ball. There is a fight now brewing over the record-setting 73rd home run ball. At that point, Alex hired an attorney, and he filed a lawsuit against Patrick Hayashi. The guy's got a better chance splitting the money than going to court. I will be the right for owner that ball at the end of this trial. You have no witnesses. You have no videotape. <laughs> An umpire has to make a decision in less than a second. Now we have that decision stretched out over weeks and weeks and weeks in a courtroom. I saw Mr. Hayashi bite a kid. Do you recall yelling out, ouch? Yes. Okay. I think it was ow. Sorry. I say it's finders, keepers, losers, weepers, man. Give the man back his damn ball. Let's move on. That pulls up the grass. The Giants are happy for you to keep any ball thrown or hit into the stands. However, this can be dangerous. So please be alert at all. All right. All right. So that's the gist. You saw the sort of you saw the sort of the, the scramble in the crowds. The baseball is thrown, right? So think of it this way. The baseball is thrown at the second. The baseball's thrown, it leaves the pitcher's hand. Barry Bonds swings the bat, and when it hits the bat, the property becomes abandoned, right? He slams it almost 400 feet into the outfield. Okay? The ball's flying through the air. The ball lands in the upper webbing, the upper portion of Popov's glove right so his glove sort of stops the momentum of the ball he doesn't secure it by closing the glove the reason why is he gets tackled <laughs> you saw the video right he gets swarmed by dozens of people surrounding him uh there's a pile on they'll just sort of pile on top of him why they'll want the million dollar ball At some point, we don't really know exactly what happened. There wasn't like any cameras, people with their iPhones, you know, Instagram Live. Right? We don't have this. It's 2001. We have just the cameras in the stadium. There were no cell phone cameras. It didn't exist. At some point, Popov goes to the ground. He's buried face down under several layers of people. 
I mean, this is just, just awful. I can't even imagine the scrum. Okay. Papa was being kicked at. He was being grabbed. People were reaching underneath his body to try to find the ball. At some point, the ball left Popov's glove. We don't know when. We don't know how. We don't know who, right? We have no idea. It could have been the ground, right? I think of like a you know the 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 the, the glove hits the floor, it bangs, and the thing goes flying. We have no idea how this happened. Then Hayashi, the other guy, sees the loose ball. So again, all these people are fighting and trying to hit and punch and kick and grab and pop off. And then Hayashi, like, oh look, there's the ball just on the floor. It's like a fumble in football, right? The ball is kind of just you know floating around. And dude just picks it up. He went to his feet. And he put it in his pocket. Then he sort of moved away from the scramble. He looked right at the camera. He held the ball. Right for the camera. It's like a law school fact pattern, like in reality, it actually happened. I couldn't make this if I wanted to. You, you watched the video. You saw it. Right? Okay. So Popov, I'm sorry, Hayashi leaves the stadium with the ball in his possession. And he says, I am the winner. I get the million dollar ball. Okay. Uh, Marissa, let me ask you, what happened next? Yeah, after, after Hayashi, he says, it's my ball. Him for conversion to court, right? Call the ball. Okay, Marissa, let me ask you a follow up question, right? So we sued for conversion of the ball. How is the court to decide who prevails here? Oh, we'll get, we'll get the grace rule in a minute, right? Is there a clear rule, a statute, or governing precedent to resolve this? Okay, so good. So, so Kinsey, let me ask you a question. What is Popov's argument uh, about why he should get the ball? Uh, because the only reason he didn't achieve possession was because he got attacked. Uh, well, let's take a step back. You're right. If you ask Popov, how do you define possession? Um, that I guess if he did enough to get the ball into his exclusive dominion. Oh, good. An uh, unequivocal dominion. There's actually question number six. I'll do it here. Kinsey, what does exclusive or unequivocal dominion mean? Um, I guess in this context, it would be like if you like, had the ball, I don't know what football like, it. Well, I mean, maybe not I was a football fan. Explain what you mean. Um, I know what you mean, but just, just explain what you're talking about here. I guess, I guess exclusive kind of the ball. So don't get the grades rule yet. Just, let's, let's just okay, good momentum, right? Yeah. What is Popo's best argument why he gets the ball? His best argument why he gets the ball yeah. because he couldn't establish control over it because of the crowd. Well, well, again, yeah, but but that's why he lost it. What's our point? Why kid? Why he's trying to? Oh, it? because it was a piece of abandoned property. And and he was the first one to do what. To gain possession. Don't take any possession. The first one to do what? Um, the first person to do what? Um, I don't know. Um, Kumam, what was, was, it, what was Papa the first person to do? What did he do? Uh, stop the ball. To stop the ball from Mesa. What is the significance of stopping the ball from Mesa? Um, it's like a good piece of good step. Ooh, you talk constructive. What does constructive mean? Um, like making a, a motion and towards your intention. What does, in general, what does constructive mean? You've probably seen that in torts, maybe in civil procedure. What does constructive mean? Remember constructive service? The process? Is that familiar? Kind of. Um, yeah, kind of. This is like a. <clears throat> 
Is it actual service of process? Oh, no. No, what's constructive mean? Is that it? What's constructive mean here? Uh, this is like this is the same as substantial set. Close, Peter. For when I think of constructive, I think of like constructive notice like right. surrounding evidence around. Is there the actual notice? Uh, no. No. Good. Constructive is a term you'll see in a lot of law classes, which means you you didn't actually do it, but you did a lot really close to it, right? You didn't actually give them service the process, but you did it enough to get service. Uh, the one that's actual notice, but you're not the person to be on, on, on notice, right? So what Popham argues here is he had constructive possession, right? He didn't actually secure the ball. He didn't actually put it into his pocket like Mr. Payashi did. But he did something important, which was stopping the momentum. He analogized the flying ball, basically a bird. That sounds stupid, but that was the analogy, right? Imagine a bird was flying through the stadium. And then the guy puts his glove up, and the bird flies into the guy's glove. The bird dies. It's easier uh, example for the death, right? The bird breaks its neck and it starts falling to the ground. And then before it hits the ground, someone else takes it, right? Who would argue there? The guy whose glove killed the bird, or the guy who picked it up off the bread, off, the, off the ground, right? Of course, the bird, the ball is not alive, right? Don't let's not be stupid, right? But the ball was effectively acting as a fugitive. It was flying through the air at a very high velocity into the crowds. Boom. By the way, you ever catch a foul ball at a baseball game? I almost did. I was actually at a Yankees game maybe ten years ago, and the ball went to the road in front of me. I was about to get it. This guy just dived up nowhere and grabbed it. So it was very annoying. Um, I was once at a hockey game. This was awful. And a, a little kid in my section had a puck go into their face. And just blind up and say, oh, this do work. You don't want to. You know, baseballs, whatever. But, you know, the, now they have the nets, right? Those nets didn't used to be there either. Like those huge nets. Anyway. Um, but the ball was flying. It was a projectile. It was a full fugitive resource. Popov's glove stopped. But he says, my glove stopped it. My glove stopped momentum. I had constructed possession. It's mine. Christina, what is the best argument put forward by the Hayashi? Um, the argument that he Okay. Does does Hayashi think it matters who stopped the momentum of the ball? According to Hashi, what would actually matter? Um, okay, there's that word again, unequivocal dominion. What does that mean? Okay, good. All right, the court agrees with Hayashi, right? We'll get to the remedy in a minute. The remedy is kind of weird, right? But the court on the, on the merits agrees with Hayashi. The court says, you know, this momentum argument doesn't work. We have basically a rule of capture. It doesn't matter who put all the work into stopping the ball of momentum. What matters who actually came away with the ball. Popov never actually clearly secured it. He didn't have unequivocal dominion. He didn't have complete control. It was always in the possession of, uh, it was only in the possession of Hayashi. Okay. So here the courts are famous the rule of capture over rule or rule of labor. Right? Whoever gets the ball wins. I mean, think of it like the whalers, right? Hayashi's kind of the jerk who found the ball on the beach. Right? He sort of Papa was getting kicked and punched and caught at and just you know abused. And now she just finds the ball rolling around. It's mine. I got it. And he knew what happened. He saw the the, the, the struggle. He did it anyway. So really, Hayashi was kind of being the jerk here. So on the law, Hayashi won. But then the court does something funny, right? The, the last part of the opinion is like, what? Huh? I thought Hayashi won. Leia, what does the court do here that's kind of weird at the end? Um, they kind of bring it back to the lady being the same route. Yeah. And if I say her intent to take control, she has your right to possess and disrespect that. So the court sort of follows the capture theory in the first part. And they go to labor theory in the second part. 
So what's the outcome of the case layout? What actually happens here? They sell it and split the profit between them. The court orders the sale and split the profit in half. Does that make even sense? Does that, I mean, does, as a legal matter, if Hayashi has full possession, why is he splitting the cost of the ball in half? Because they couldn't decide with possession. But why couldn't the court just say, stop at the first party opinion and say, well, roll capture, Hayashi wins, game over, ball game over. Hayashi wins, judge for Hayashi. Why couldn't the court just end it there? Um. Why couldn't the court just say, rule of capture, Hayashi wins, that's it, go home. Leave me alone. Because that would affect uh, precedent, precedent cases with the legal team. I mean, come on, we're in the 2002, right? No, I mean, we're not, we're not hunting ducks, so we're, we're in San Francisco, there's a pretty modern society. And that would affect uh, future cases. Why did the court didn't want to give a full victory to Hayashi? Because then in the future when People argue the labor theory and efforts to collect yeah. the fruit of their labor. They could use this case to negate that idea. That's okay. That's good. Chad, why do you think another reason why the court didn't just give the ball to Hashi and see who's on with it? Um, similar to how they said that they're either from the ability to glory and the ability to glory. So people could argue that honestly, they're going to be used by the Which is the fair thing to do here? What did Barrett Bond say? But, yeah, so look, the first half of the case, I think, was actually probably right in the law, right? I think Popov stopped the ball momentum, but that's not enough. He never secured possession. If you're a football fan, if you're bobbling the ball in your hands, that's not a catch. You have to secure it, clear it to your chest, and secure it as you hit the ground, right? You can't just bobble in the air. you got to have it in your possession and hit the ground. So I think that part of the opinion was, was I think, probably right. But then he says, well, you know, but I'm still a judge, and judges do fair, so we do equity, and whatever. Just put the ball. And the guy just made it the last part, right? Just, you know, because he thought it wasn't fair. I think also because he thought that, again, Popov did all the hard work of securing it, got kicked and punched, and then Hayashi just kind of, whoop, zipped up. Okay. So the whole thing is rule of capture, but for the remedy, we'll factor in labor theory. Right? I mean, that's kind of what the court does here. Of, you know, I think I think uh, Christina Leia and Jen made that point quite well. All right. Uh, also, awesome. did you hand up? Yeah, I feel like most of the pre-possessory interest, and I found that uh, played in this. Well, pre-possessory interest is kind of a weird idea, right? It's you basically have it in his possession, but he made contact with it, but he didn't secure the possession after going down. And the court rewarded him for being just at the right place at the right time, so he could still right there. But wait, is that even labor or that one? Because they were all just kind of you know, crowd into this, this this outfield, and it happened that one inch where it's well, look, it's here, it's there, it's also flat. It's not clear there was even labor, right? He just was bought, bought a ticket after the last two plays by the time. Phil also found to this day, well, if you notice this ballpark was right by the by the by the day, he found to his water. There were kayaks all over the place. Oh, yeah, Laura. Um, it's weird. And the court doesn't really define it. I don't think we'll come back to it this semester. I'm not sure if any other case involves it. All right. Uh, I got a minute left. Um, I usually close the class that I call a minute poll. Um, it's short answer. It's not graded. If you, you have questions or things in your mind, just type them in there. I read it. I don't always respond to all of them, but it helps me get a pulse. If things didn't go well, if you have a reflection or things that I could do more clearly, just put in there. So let me just wrap up in a bit. We have a couple major um, takeaways from, from, the, from the class today. Um, first, very importantly, we have a capture theory, right? Courts, sometimes, not always, follow rule of capture. Whoever gets the item first wins, but how to acquire it often varies based on what the thing is. You will capture a baseball differently than you capture a whale. But still lurking in the background is the rule of labor, the labor theory. And courts tend to reward, one way or another, people for more effort into hunting. You see this in the whale case. You see it a little bit in the duck case. And even in the baseball case with whoever gets the whale, or gets the baseball, keeps it, but then you split the profit for the guy who worked harder for it. Okay. All right. I will leave the minute poll running for a couple more minutes. Um, any other questions before we wrap up? 
All right. Uh, for class on Thursday, just just 30 more seconds. Uh, I gave you a reading that's a little bit unusual. Uh, it's it's kind of a fake hypothetical story of hunters, uh, uh, cave hikers who get trapped in a cave. I trust me. There's a reason why I'm giving it to you. you. You'll enjoy it. Okay. So as you read it, I want you to think which judge agree with the most. All right. I'll see you all in class on Thursday. Thank you so much. Yes. Uh,